Um, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Javi for allowing me, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Um, my talk is going to be about uh, wheel walking implementation on Rock. So the talk is going to be coming a bit more from the user's perspective. Uh, so I think it's maybe a bit more suited for the newcomers to Rock um, than for the ones who are actually already experts. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Tim Wiese. Um, I'm currently a master's student in robotics at uh, Munich Technical University. And, uh, but as you can see here um, with the templates of the slides, uh, this is actually a talk that is focusing on a project that was done uh, together with uh, ESA um, because I was an intern here um, in the Planetary Robotics Laboratory at STEC uh, last year and that's uh, the time frame um, when this project was actually done. Okay, um, a little bit about the outline, um, what I'm going to talk, talk about today. Um, first of all, a bit about the project background so that you know um, what wheel walking is, uh, what it is about, why this project was actually launched. Um, yeah, then the testing platform, what was the rover that we used to test this. Um, just one quick slide about kinematics, um, just so you know um, what it is and what we try to implement. Um, the code structure, um, then uh, the whole network. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, then uh, about the component network that we used, uh, so all the components uh, that we had running um, in the project. Uh, then uh, I'm thinking, I was thinking about uh, looking a bit into the scripts and the source code just to show um, how easy it is actually to uh, um, implement such a um, project uh, that was relatively simple on the rock side of things. Um, then a look about, at field testing, um, when we went field testing with the rover and uh, what we learned there when uh, running rock in that environment. And uh, yeah, then a quick slide about conclusions. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it for the talk. Um, yeah, project background. Um, on the right, you see the ExoMars rover. Um, I think uh, most of you um, know at least roughly about the project. Um, it's going to launch, or it's supposed to launch in 2018. And uh, the rover um, has a locomotion system that actually features some additional joints um, that are supposed to be used to deploy the wheels when the rover is sitting on the lander platform but uh, they are supposed to be latched after this happened. So these uh, joints currently only have this one functionality. Um, they are supposed to deploy the wheels and then they're latched and then they're not used again um, afterwards in the mission. And uh, the idea behind wheel walking is to actually use these types of additional joints to perform some kind of walking motion um, to get additional traction um, for the rover um, and to, for example, be able to drive up slopes with uh, less slip or to escape sand traps um, to avoid situations like with the Spirit rover that got stuck on Mars. Um, yeah, and to investigate the benefits of um, the wheel walking, um, a project was launched actually in the Planetary Robotics Laboratory um, in, uh, I think, at the end of 2013 and uh, is now being investigated. Yeah, a quick video. Um, wheel walking has already quite some history, so the Russians um, have already done some research on it in, uh, I think it was in the 60s and 70s. Um, so uh, they built some rovers which were actually doing some kind of wheel walking motion. And um, you can see here what wheel walking basically means. Um, you have these additional joints in your locomotion system. Let me run it again. Um, that can basically move below the rover body um, and then other joints which are actually um, leave the wheels in place so that the rover can uh, like push itself forward um, like here, kind of like the motion that a human does. So like you have, you have a foot and you, you move it forward below your body and then you press on the ground um, to actually push yourself forward. Uh, yeah, this on the right side, this is the rover that we have in our lab. Um, you will actually, I think, actually see it in, uh, in wheel walking motion later today at uh, six o'clock at, um, um, at the welcome drinks. And uh, this is called the Exoterra rover. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a testing rover, which uh, has a locomotion system that is quite similar to the one of ExoMars. So it has also six wheels um, and it has a triple boogie configuration with a passive boogie in the back and two passive boogies in the front. And uh, it has these wheel walking um, joints here that allow the wheels to actually swivel backwards and forwards. Um, yeah, internally, um, the server drives are connected by a canvas 
and uh, it's running a PC-104 stack with a Core i7 CPU, and uh, Ubuntu is running on it um, with the ROC framework. Yeah, one slide I said I wanted to show about uh, actually the wheel walking kinematics, so uh, that's what we wanted to implement in this uh, ROC module. Um, so the idea is basically, um, well, let me backtrack a bit. In the past, the way that um, wheel walking was actually implemented was kind of in a more of a static way, um, basically in a time control fashion that you would simply say, okay, um, I have my wheel walking joints and I simply move it forward for um, a couple of seconds or, uh, and, and I move the other ones or I, I leave the other wheels um, in their position for that time. Um, so the whole body kinematics was not taken into account. And uh, the idea was now to actually implement a full kinematic model for the rover, um, six degrees of freedom. And um, basically the approach is that uh, you try to find a Jacobian formulation that relates your um, body coordinate system um, to the um, joints of your, of your mechanism, or to, to the joint traits of your mechanism. And uh, the way you do it is by basically formulating a Jacobian per kinematic chain. So you try to find a Jacobian from um, that relates your, your body pose rates to um, the joint rates for the first contact point, for the second contact point, for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then, then you merge all these Jacobians into one big Jacobian, one sparse matrix. Um, then you introduce some constraints. So basically for a wheel walking, you would, for example, say if you would just want to move the um, first axle, you would say, okay, I introduce a constraint that my first axle wheels should move with a certain velocity. Um, and the hind, even the back wheels should move with a velocity of zero, for example. And then uh, you would solve the system of equation and then you would end up with the um, joint rates that you would want to command to your uh, motors. Okay, so this we then uh, implemented in a um, rock module. Um, the basic structure of a rock module looks like this. Um, you have an origin component here at the top, um, which basically hooks into the um, network of rock components. And uh, this is the only part of the, whole, um, of the whole stack that is actually framework dependent. So everything below here um, is framework independent, so you don't need to worry about anything. You can just basically code away. And then you have to have this one um, component here on the top, the origin component, which then uh, um, basically takes your library, um, calls the specific functions, and uh, integrates it into your uh, network of, of rock components. Um, yeah, maybe a bit more details about that. As I said, the origin task, um, that's the one that hooks into the rock component network. Then we um, had this uh, wheel walking control class, which was actually um, the, um, basically the interface to the origin component. So this origin component called the methods of this uh, wheel walking control component. Um, this was actually also responsible for handling transition between gates. So like, for example, if you um, wanted to move like your, your um, wheels left, um, left and right, so first the left side and the right side, um, that is one gate. Another gate would be you move the first axle, then the second axle, and the third axle, and you somehow have to transition between these modes. Um, and that's what was handled by this wheel walking control class. Uh, the kinematics class um, is below here. That basically um, implements the sequence of motions inside the gate. So when to move the first axle, when to move the second axle, when to transition to the third axle movement. And uh, this then calls the kinematic model. Um, and the kinematic model is what actually implements this, um, yeah, this Jacobian and implements the computation of these unknown joint rates that you um, want to compute and then uh, that you want to command to your, um, to your um, joints. Yeah, and uh, what we actually did is uh, there is already a class in ROC, which uh, is this kinematic model class from the odometry package. And uh, we use this uh, as, a, as a base for our kinematic model class. So we basically simply implemented the message from this um, so that it's done in a standardized way. Okay, and uh, once we had this uh, component done, we had to integrate it into our whole network. Um, that's what uh, this picture shows. So basically the component you just saw is this wheel walking control component. And uh, this hooked, hooked into our, net, our network. Um, we had a joystick to command this. Um, 
at the bottom here, we had the platform driver. So this basically um, was a driver that uh, actually commanded the um, joints and the joint motors. Um, we had a joint dispatcher here in between, um, which is actually um, handling uh, um, the distribution of the, of the um, joint commands to the different components so far. So we have here, for example, we have the wheel walking control, which uh, is controlling um, the walking joints or the driving joints. And then here is, for example, the PTU control component, which is uh, handling the um, control of the pan and tilt unit, which was on the rover. Um, yeah, and we had some additional components here actually running uh, at the side. So uh, for field testing, we needed a, a tracking component, um, which got data from a tracking system so that we could actually um, measure body pose and uh, body position uh, externally. And then there were also, also running a component for uh, IMU and uh, also a camera component just to uh, log some additional data. Okay, now I just want to um, have a quick look into uh, the scripts and the source code um, that we implemented. Um, just to, to show you that uh, it's actually not that much work for such a, such a relatively simple component um, to get it run, uh, to get it inter integrated into Rock. So uh, this is the, the um, origin file that actually um, describes the, um, yeah, the structure of the origin component basically. Um, and uh, I mean, the main things to see here is uh, that, that we create this um, task context and uh, we have a couple of properties um, that we, um, that we uh, list here, um, which in this case are the joint commands names and the joint readings names, but there was actually a, a couple of more, um, like the, the initial gates that we wanted to have in our, um, in our component, like, uh, or for example, the initial speed that was set for the wheel walking. Um, and uh, then the other thing we need to specify were input and output ports. Um, so we uh, have an input port for the joystick commands, so you control it by a joystick and uh, um, the commands get fed into the component. Um, we have an input port for joint readings, so that's the um, joint readings that we get from the, um, uh, from the platform driver fed through uh, the joint dispatcher. And uh, then we have an output port on which are the joint commands which we computed and then we feed back to the, um, to the uh, drives. And uh, yeah, there's one, there's one last line in here, which is the port-driven one, um, which basically says that, uh, okay, every time we get a new joint reading um, fed up from, from the um, platform driver, um, then um, we um, run one iteration of uh, our um, wheel walking component. Uh, yeah, this is the, the source code file for, for, the, uh, for this origin component. Um, also just wanna go quickly through here. Um, this is also the main code that is in there. There's not much more. Um, we have uh, um, the constructor here, which actually, uh, which, which um, connects this origin component to our library. So uh, we create a new wheel walking control object. Um, and then uh, we are able to actually call these methods. Um, in the configure hook, we simply um, basically get the values um, of, our, um, of our configuration options. And then in the update hook, what happens here is basically whenever we um, read new data from our joystick or whenever we read new data from um, our platform driver, um, then we, we evaluate this data. Um, and after we have done this, I mean, evaluating means in this case, for example, calling some methods, um, calling some methods of the wheel walking controller class. Um, and uh, when, once we've done that in every iteration, um, we um, call the method get joint commands from our wheel walking control and uh, iterate our kinematic model once and uh, get new control data um, that we then send out to the um, motors. Uh, deployments, um, I'm thinking, yeah, time wise, let's see. Uh, I think I'm still good. Um, so deployments, uh, we actually grouped together some components that we had uh, into deployments. Um, one is the Exoter control deployment, one is the Exoter ground truth component um, deployment. Um, so basically what happens here is simply, um, uh, we simply group together um, several, uh, several components that we're running. Um, we have the platform driver, we have the PTU control, the joint dispatchers, and the wheel walking control here. Um, that's the Exoter control deployment. Um, here you can actually see the platform driver is running uh, um, here at every, uh, 
what is it, 80 milliseconds. Um, so every 80 milliseconds, the platform driver outputs one joint reading. Um, so, and because the other components were pod driven, that means also the other components um, are running at that rate. And uh, yeah, the Exeter ground truth is for running the tracking um, components. And last but not least, um, that's what basically glues everything together. The uh, script that actually runs the wheel walking um, stuff. Uh, also, just some major, some, some, some things that I want to mention. Um, basically, we, uh, we run these two deployments that I just showed you, the control deployment and the ground truth deployment. And uh, in the first part here, we simply configure them. Um, Maybe the interesting thing here is uh, we have two joint dispatchers. Uh, these joint dispatchers are actually um, simply two instances of one, of the, of, of one and the same um, component. And uh, they behave differently because the um, configuration option that is set for them is a different one. So this one, this joint dispatcher is set as a reading joint dispatcher and this one as a commanding joint dispatcher. Um, yeah, logging in ROC, I mean, basically we only put in this single command, we want to log all ports, so we, we want to log the data that uh, goes in and out of our ports, and that's basically it. Um, then the rest of the logging is, is handled by ROC and, uh, and uh, we get the data nice, um, nicely um, logged in a file. Then basically we simply connect um, our components together in a big network, um, so the platform driver is connected to the joint dispatcher, the wheel walking control is, is also connected to the joint dispatcher, the joystick is connected to the wheel walking control, and so on and so forth. So this is basically in text form what you saw on the, um, on the picture you saw, the pictogram, and then we simply start all the components on the components and then we're good and then everything's running nicely. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, Source code management, we uh, worked on this stuff actually with several people in several different locations. Um, so the rover was situated here at STEC in the lab. Um, but uh, we were actually, I mean, of course, a lot of coding was done here uh, in Nordwijk, but uh, there was also um, um, stuff done at DFK in Bremen and uh, also from Munich. Um, so we had to have some way of actually, um, you know, collaborating on this. Uh, so uh, what we did is uh, we, we hosted our repositories on GitHub um, actually, they're publicly, publicly available, so if you want to have a look, you can go to the site and check them out. And uh, this was then integrated into the um, ROC build system, so uh, whenever we ran an auto project update, um, all, the all the repositories were actually um, updated as well. So the code was, was fetched from the repositories um, if there were any changes. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, in the end, what was nice is also when we had a clean system to set up rock. I mean, it's, uh, it's relatively easy. Um, we had a bootstrap file which we simply downloaded, then you run the bootstrap file, then you wait sometimes for quite a long time to, for everything to download and compile. And then hopefully if everything's set up correctly, then you're done. So I mean, the steps to get rock running from the start are actually pretty simply, simple. Um, if you don't have any glitches, like you're not able to connect to GitHub or something like that. Okay, um, yeah, um, I'm almost at the end. Um, uh, now I want to have a quick look at field testing. So uh, after implementing the wheel walking stuff, um, here in the lab we actually took the rover to uh, DLR in uh, Oberpfaffenhofen near Munich um, for some, um, some field testing. So we wanted to see what actually were the performance benefits um, of wheel walking, especially on a slope. Um, so the, the setup we had here is we had there is uh, we had a laptop. Um, which was wirelessly connected to a, to a gamepad to control the rover. Um, we had the rover sitting um, on the test bed. Um, we, had, we deployed two wireless networks um, to which we connected. Um, the rover was connected to this field robotics network wirelessly so that uh, we could actually run it um, on the test bed without having to connect the cable. Um, we had the laptop connected to this network by cable. And then we also had uh, um, the R tracking server um, connected to the same word network so that the um, tracking data that we got from the um, ART system um, was actually directly fed into uh, the robot system and uh, locked together um, with the other data. 
And uh, yeah, to be able to actually do code changes locally, but also to be able to do any code changes uh, externally. We also hooked this up to another network, which was then connected to the internet, so that we had um, GitHub access, um, so that we could actually do some code changes on the fly. Um, Yeah, this is what it looked like. Um, I mean, it, it was basically a big sand pit um, in the basement of DLR um, where we set up the rover, pretty dusty environment. Um, we had uh, one laptop here um, running all our stuff. We had the rover um, together with uh, two network deplo networks deployed and uh, all the operations were run from this one laptop um, which we connected to the rover via SSH. Um, and uh, the gamepad was uh, connected to the, lab to, to the laptop directly um, and the wheel walking component was running on the rover. Um, what was nice is that this connection between the gamepad which was, which was connected to the um, laptop and the wheel walking component that was running on the rover, that was really easy to do. Um, using, the, using the naming service, um, which is already um, built into Rock, um, I mean these components pretty effortlessly um, communicated with each other. Yeah, and then uh, also the logging, I mean, as I said before, basically we put in, there, there was this one line um, we had to put in for, um, for logging in the, um, in the code. Um, so the, log, the logging was done um, by rock, so basically we got out um, timestamp log files, which uh, we could then afterwards um, uh, evaluate um, for the data that we needed. Okay, and as I said, on the fly code changes, because we hooked everything up also to the internet and to GitHub, um, we could um, do some coding either locally here or, uh, or at STEC, um, sync the changes um, with the rover via GitHub, simply compile and then run and continue the tests. Okay, um, quick video um, for you to see uh, what it actually looked like running on the rover. I mean, this is simply the rover going with the wheel walking um, in zero degrees. So there's no slope here. Um, but what you can see is uh, that actually the rover body is uh, traveling um, pretty nicely, um, continuously forward while the um, wheels down here are actually doing the wheel walking motion um, below the rover. I mean, this is just one gate that um, was implemented. Um, there were also different gates like, for example, um, like a skiing motion where you move all the left wheels first and then all the right wheels first and so on and so forth. Um, also, what you could think of is uh, moving one wheel at a time. Okay, um, quick conclusions. Um, what did I take away from this project? Um, seeing that before um, I started this project, I uh, had, had not used Rock before. Um, I was only familiar with uh, Ross uh, from a project at the university. And uh, for me, it was pretty easy to actually transfer it to, to Rock. So, uh, I mean, some of the basic concepts from Ross, I also found again in Rock. So um, the transition for me was, was not that hard. Um, the tutorials on the website, I thought were pretty helpful. So whoever wants to get started with Rock, Go, to, go do the tutorials. Um, I think they're really, really good to get you going. Um, the separation of framework and library code, um, which is, I, I think, different than, than how Ross does it, um, I thought was, was, was pretty nice. So, I mean, we, we uh, for example, in our, in, our, um, in, uh, in our project, I mean, we, we basically had this big reworking library, which we could code without taking into to account anything. Um, of the framework it's itself, and then we had this one little component, which was the glue between the, the library and the, um, uh, and the rock framework. Uh, yeah, connecting components, um, especially over network, was straightforward and pretty easy, as I said. Um, the logging capabilities were really, um, um, really easy to use. Um, rock display for, for displaying data, rock replay um, for replaying the log files um, were nice to use. Um, External code repositories, as I said, we integrated um, and uh, that was also um, yeah, quite straightforward. Um, config files as well, um, we didn't have, have any big issues with it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know if these are really minus points. I mean, some tutorial pages I found had some little mistakes when I was uh, doing the tutorials. Um, 
uh, weren't up to date. Um, maybe cha maybe that changed in the meantime. Next time, I just you know gonna write a quick email if I find some error or something. Um, uh, for me, but that's I guess that's a personal issue. Uh, I had never done any Ruby scripting before, so for me that was the biggest learning curve to to learn a bit of Ruby for that. Um, and the last one I also put in here, um, I mean, whenever we basically did a clean install, it took quite some time uh, for the Rock system to be up and running. So I don't know, depending on the laptop speed or so, it could take, I don't know, one to two hours or so until everything, everything was uh, downloaded and compiled and, and uh, ready to go. Um, yeah, but all in all, to conclude, um, I think the using Rock for this project was uh, yeah, greatly contributed to, to, to the success. Um, without using any any framework at all, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible, I guess. Um, and also, especially with Rock, I mean, we I think we we managed pretty well to get this running, and uh, it was quite 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 easy to use and quite easy to implement the stuff for it. Okay, um, yeah, maybe a quick last remark. Um, if anybody wants to see actual results of this wheel walking, uh, there is going to be a talk today by Martin Afferrate at uh, 1555 in Newton One, but I think it clashes with the workshop here. Uh, so maybe don't go there, but read the paper. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks, thanks so far for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, my Ross experience also before was not really that huge because I only used it in like a, a lab project at university. Um, I mean, generally, um, I guess probably Javi, Javi knows, knows more about that, but uh, um, generally the benefits of Rock are, are real-time capabilities, I guess. Um, I don't know, Javi, you want to add, add something about that? Separation framework and library is obviously not um, what you would expect to use for Rock mm -hmm. and Ruby one. It's just that it's just a quick step in the library to have a run. It's just that in Rock, the first thing you do is create the library just to get one and configure the library in your components. So when you start, you actually are trying to save time. So it happens small often. Rock doesn't do that. First thing you do is create a node. And so in Rock, you'll find a lot of projects to build this guy. Uh, the other one is, yeah, I'd say the, at this level of this magnitude, the biggest um, class of rock is this thing that you can deploy on spam software. The things are not only uh, they stay annoying, but you don't do much when you do much. You don't have a middle web when, when you do that. So if you want hard real time, that's how you get real time, hard real time. And of course, you don't, if you want really high frequency, you don't pay for for doing real time. Um, but I would say. <laughs> I was I was thinking that yeah this question would would probably come up. This was actually um, some um, some presents which were brought from the Netherlands uh, for the guys at DLR. Uh, 
uh, Javi, do you remember what it actually was? I, I think it. But I didn't. I don't think it was beer. I'm not sure. Was it? Yeah, yeah. It was a present for the DLR guys. Yeah, yeah. For allowing us to come there and then use their use their lab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we actually, we actually, we didn't only bring alcohol. We also brought some uh, chocomel, which was like also like a pretty Dutch thing. Yeah, of course not. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks.